As the fifth topic, uh, we focus on uh, so-called contextual variables, often denoted by symbol Z. And uh, we start by first uh, considering what exactly are these uh, Z variables and uh, where to put them in the frontier models. So firstly, what are the, what are the Z variables, how to interpret them? So in many, many contexts, uh, there are some um, additional explanatory variables that are not really inputs or output as such, but they would influence the output or performance or productivity and, and so on. So they seem relevant, but it's, it's difficult to interpret them as, uh, as inputs or outputs as such. At this point, it's maybe first to note that uh, in not all applications, it's directly self-evident even that what which variables should be inputs and which should be outputs. So that's already a somewhat challenging task. Uh, and uh, there is not really such a um, always so self-evident classification that which variables are inputs, which are outputs, and which are Z variables. But at least um, the Z variables uh, provide some additional flexibility when, when we have some kind of additional information that doesn't fit to this kind of input-output framework very easily. So this can, this can then broaden the possibilities for modeling. And I also note on this slide that, uh, that um, sometimes the contextual variables are uh, either binary dummy variables that take value of zero or one, or they can be a uh, continuous scale between zero and one, for example, percentages or ratios. So uh, such kind of binary variables or percentages are difficult to model as inputs or outputs as such. But for example, uh, some kind of ratios or percentages might, for example, uh, reflect the different quality of the same output. Uh, so you might have then, uh, for example, uh, different type of uh, or different quality of output and you could model the quantity of output as an output variable and then quality as a Z variable. That's uh, like one possible example of the, of the Z variables. But uh, in general, there is a, a lot of flexibility for the user to interpret that what, what exactly are inputs and what are the outputs and uh, what are the Z variables. And in, in my op opinion, there is too little attention to this kind of um, uh, soft modeling or, or model specification part of the, that very often we are interested in the uh, quantitative methods of estimating the model, but the model specification uh, that involves a lot of tacit knowledge, and there is a lot of tacit knowledge in the uh, in the field, but uh, it's often not really clearly articulated or not clearly enough. So I'll try to address it a, a little bit also. That okay, what do we what do we mean by the by the z variables? Uh, very often the situation is such that uh, that these uh, z variables. Uh, uh, reflect the external factors influencing the firm or its performance. Uh, and uh, in many applications, the motivation of modeling the Z variables comes from the fact that the uh, uh, fairness of the efficiency analysis uh, requires that we somehow control these external factors. Uh, I have indicated here some examples like, uh, like uh, uh, situation with competition, different type of regulation faced by the companies, weather conditions, location, and so on and so on. And uh, often the idea is that, uh, that uh, managers of the firm, they have to take these kind of external factors as given and they cannot really, really influence them. And the purpose is just to adjust for the uh, efficiency estimates for these kind of external conditions. Of course, sometimes this, uh, uh, we know that there are differences in these external conditions, but we do not have enough data to, to really model it. So, for example, these kind of CS issues, like we mentioned here, competition or regulation or weather conditions, uh, location, uh, we might know something about weather, but, uh, but uh, it's sometimes very difficult to model exactly a huge amount of information about the weather conditions. So... Um, I'll clarify later that, of course, this kind of unobserved heterogeneity is then left to the composite error term. Another point is that uh, even though we model these external factors uh, uh, to the firm, that they might be beyond the control of the management, but it can be still interesting for the policymakers who might be able to influence, for example, uh, 
the regulation faced by the firm. So there is some kind of systematic uh, um, systematic differences of firms in certain or, or different types of regulation. Uh, uh, then then uh, it might help when the policymakers to then change the regulation to to encourage productivity if that is what the policymakers want. So not always the external factors are beyond the control of all of all decision makers or all relative re relevant uh, decision makers. Uh, so I mentioned that external factors are very common, but it can be also that uh, contextual variables reflect some internal factors that are within the firm. Uh, for example, it could be interesting to model management practices and impact of management practices on the, on the firm performance. Uh, another example is the ownership. If, uh, for example, this is very often in the like, education context that uh, are, are private schools uh, more efficient than public schools or other way around. Uh, so these kind of issues can be also of interest and they could be modeled by contextual variables. So I want to emphasize that the contextual variables are not always just some kind of external factors that are beyond the control of the firm. Sometimes they can be internal factors are, are, that are actually controlled by the firms. And uh, this can be a very fascinating area if we can help like uh, sort of open up the black box of this um, inefficiency and shed light that what kind of uh, practices actually uh, lead to better performers. This can, of, of course, have directly direct relevance to the management to, to then improve performance and in, improve efficiency or productivity if we have some evidence that certain kind of practices or ownership structure uh, can help to improve performance. So that can be even more, more interesting from the, from the managerial point of view than controlling for the external factors. And in general, the the Z variables can, of course, con include both external and internal factors. So this is something that uh, is not entirely clearly articulated in the literature, in my view. So, so it's helpful to think about that, that Z variables, they can be external, but they can be also internal factors. And both types of Z variables are actually used in the applications. So let me also connect it to this uh, um, application that we have considered uh, in this class. So, so I've talked about the incentive regulation of uh, Finnish electricity distribution firms. And here is a couple of points I want to want to mention regarding the Z variables. So there could be potentially interesting uh, uh, internal factors also in this uh, electricity distribution firm. So we might be interested in looking, for example, public versus private ownership of the, of the distribution firms, or what would be the impact of foreign ownership on, on performance, that are, are foreign-owned companies more efficient than domestic companies? Um, how about outsourcing of labor? So I think it would be possible to measure that to what extent uh, um, labor has been outsourced to, to some, uh, some other companies. These kind of uh, factors could influence uh, efficiency, and it would be very fascinating to to study such kind of uh, uh, impacts. However, from the point of view of uh, regulation, such uh, issues like outsourcing or efficient or outsourcing or ownership are not really that relevant because by the law, the regulation should be the same irrespective of the type of ownership or, or their management practices. So in this kind of uh, incentive regulation, these kind of internal factors are not really, uh, really relevant as such. Um, however, this kind of external operating environment is, of course, interest because, uh, because um, firms really cannot relocate. So they have a local monopoly within certain uh, operating area. And uh, therefore, differences in the, in the operational conditions given by this uh, certain location are of, uh, of uh, considerable interest and are often controlled in this type of uh, yardstick competition uh, applications. Um, in the studies related to the regulation, we have actually tested a lot of lot of different uh, uh, operational conditions uh, by by um, applying statistical testing that, that to find find if there are some significant explanatory factors. We have looked at uh, some kind of weather conditions like wind speeds or snow depth and uh, so on and so on. Uh, in the third regulation period, actually the only statistically significant explanatory variable that we could find was the percentage of underground cable uh, middle voltage network. 
So that was used as the as the Z variable during that time from 2012 to 2016. However, from the point of view of incentives, there is of course um, uh, an issue that if if we if we start to reward uh, the companies for uh, for a high percentage of underground cable networks, so of course then the this is not really beyond the control of the of the companies. So this is in some sense uh, uh, within the control of the firms. So so this was one of the factors that led actually to many companies to increase their um, underground cable part. There's of course also other other incentives for them to do that, but this was also one of them. And for the for the fourth and fifth regulation period, then the uh, Finnish energy regulator wanted to have something something else as the Z variable. So from uh, from the purely statistical point of view, uh, this um, percentage of underground cable networks remained the best explanatory variable, but uh, but it would give wrong incentive to then use too much underground cabling, and we paid a lot of attention again to statistical testing of potential Z variables that could be inserted to the model. And uh, finally, only, only, only useful substitute for the underground cabling turned out to be the uh, percentage of connection points per user. So the idea there is that, uh, that uh, consider, for example, some um, apartment uh, building with several apartments in the same building. So then there is a number of use points is equal to the number of apartments, but there's only single connection point in the building. So this uh, ratio of connection points to users indicates that uh, to what extent there are uh, like single, single household dwellings versus uh, uh, multiple household apartments. So uh, in, in uh, rural areas, this uh, ratio of connection points per user tends to be very close to one because there is only, only single single houses, uh, separate houses. Whereas in, in uh, larger cities like in Helsinki, then this, uh, this ratio is uh, relatively low because most people live in, in, in uh, apartment buildings. So, uh, and this is also something that is completely beyond the control of the electricity distribution firms. So this proves an uh, exogenous, uh, exogenous uh, Z variable that, that influences the cost and uh, does not give some uh, preference to one type of technical solution to another. So therefore, for the fourth and fifth regulation period, the energy regulator replaced this uh, percentage of underground cable network by this uh, percentage of connection points per user. So you see also the Z variables can, can have impact on in terms of incentives, and it's good to be in this kind of uh, incentive regulation, also be aware of that what kind of incentives the Z variable might be might be uh, giving to the regulated companies. And, uh, and also this illustrates that it's not always the best empirical fit or the, or the best uh, uh, statistical performance that matters. We also need to consider the, the incentives that the user one or the other variable can, can have on the, on, the, on the regulation. So let's then move on to the bit more technical question of where do we actually put these Z variables in the in the frontier model? And I will next consider four possibilities. So one obvious one is to, to put it as the part of the production function or more broadly the technology. We could also then put the Z variables as part of the inefficiency term and I, I will explain shortly why how we do it. Uh, it could also of course affect the, the noise term separately. So that would be then some kind of factors influencing heteroscelasticity. And of course, then we can, we can just model them separately without really making a, making a clear stand that if, is it technology or inefficiency. So to be more specific, let's first consider the contextual variables as input. And if you think about the, the uh, unified uh, frontier model, I have here indicated the vector of Z variables with the, with the red color uh, so that we could put it inside the production function and essentially model these Z variables as, as if they were inputs. So at this point, maybe it's good to also clarify this one, one issue that came out uh, frequently in, the, in, the, in this uh, questions. So notice that the Z variables, they reflect the 
heterogeneity of firms, so observed heterogeneity. Of course, the Z variables must be something that we observe, whereas the noise term V would then capture any unobserved heterogeneity. So there can be, of course, still some, some differences in firms and their operating environments that we cannot really control by this uh, Z. We, perhaps we do not have some measured data for those. And also, if you just uh, just uh, fail to control for, or we choose not to put these Z variables anywhere, then of course the heterogeneity will be captured by the composite error term, so it can influence the inefficiency term U or the noise term V. So the classic DEA approach actually would be to model the Z variables as if they were inputs. This is what uh, what uh, this, uh, paper by Banker and Mori from 1986 is uh, is doing. So they they refer to these uh, z variables as uh, non-discretionary inputs but then of course there comes some some uh, in general case that then then we might ask that okay are these z variables substitutable with inputs can we can we substitute inputs by z variables uh, um, does does the z variable necessarily increase the output uh, and and perhaps most importantly in the in the context of axiomatic DEA, does, do these Z variables satisfy those axioms like free disposability and convexity? So especially this convexity axiom became under question then later in the, in the DEA literature. So this is not really then uh, so commonly used nowadays also even in the, in the DEA literature. more classical SFA approach, on the other hand, is to treat these uh, Z variables as part of the inefficiency term U. So this inefficiency depends now on the, on the Z variables. And uh, we will discuss some alternative parameterizations in the next lesson, where we, where we look into the SFA treatment in more detail. So that's another possibility to, to model the Z variables, that, uh, that it influences the distribution of the inefficiency term. Of course, then, it might be the case that this uh, Z variables influence not only the inefficiency term, but also the, also the noise term. So we always assume that the noise term is symmetric and has a, has a zero mean. So essentially, then the Z variables would influence the heteroscedasticity of the noise term. And there are some attempts to, to model that. So I mentioned here this Hadri's uh, paper as an example. You have this kind of doubly heteroscedastic model where Z variables influence both U and, and V. Uh, of course, to be able to tell the difference between the impact of C, is it, is it in, in inefficiency term U or noise term V, it's very, very difficult. In, in practice, it's, it's almost impossible. So to distinguish the impact of C on inefficiency or noise then really requires some, some uh, uh, distributional assumptions. Mainly, of course, the, we, if you remember from the, from the discussion of the SFA, that uh, how to distinguish the noise from inefficiency, it really relies on the, on the, on the skewness of the, of the composite error term. So, so if then these D variables influence the skewness, then perhaps this is the way to, way to, way to uh, identify these different impacts. So we come back to this also in the context of the SFA in a little bit more detail. And finally, I mentioned that uh, one possibility is to not make a, make a strong uh, stand beforehand that where does the Z variables, are they part of the production function or are they part of the inefficiency term? So here I have a phrase so-called semi-non-parametric uh, uh, equation where I put this uh, uh, Z variables separate from the production function and inefficiency. So um, this interpretation allows us to just uh, model uh, the Z variables as some factors that influence the output. And of course, they also affect productivity and efficiency indirectly. But uh, we don't really need to say that is it part of the technology or are the Z variables part of the inefficiency term. In fact, both interpretations are equally equally valid as I have indicated on the lower part of the slide. So notice that with these squared brackets, we can, we can think of uh, this uh, uh, component of the Z variables that it influences the production function, or it could be influencing the inefficiency term. 
And indeed, it's very, very difficult to tell the difference. Is it, is it part of inefficiency or is it part of technology? To be able to identify that, we would need to some rather strong uh, parametric assumptions. And uh, if you are not really willing to make such kind of assumptions, then perhaps it's in some sense more honest to just leave it leave it as, as this, that, okay, we, we recognize that these Z variables uh, influence performance, but, uh, but unless we are not really sure that they are part of the technology or part of the inefficiency, then we can, we can model it in, in, in this way as in a semi-non-parametric fashion. So I will next, next in the next uh, video lesson, I will move on to this uh, more SFA style modeling of Z variables and, uh, and point out some, some alternative approaches in that stream of literature.